many of you um, know of the Pleiadians and uh, are familiar with at least some of the basic extraterrestrial information? Raise your hand. Okay. How many here for the very first time, first UFO lecture ever? Okay. Okay. Um, the Andromedans represent a group called the Andromedan Council that is made up of 139 planetary systems. It is like a, a galactic United Nations, but it's only one of several that exist in our galaxy. There is a political hierarchy. Even in the spiritual realms, there's a hierarchy. Even when dealing with the negative extraterrestrials, there's a hierarchy. So politics, unfortunately, doesn't end here on Earth. It actually extends out there. However, um, they, even the negatives seem to be a hell of a lot more responsible than the elected officials we have on our, our planet today. Okay, they're here because we have serious problems. The planet itself has serious problems. According to the Andromedans, with the destruction of the ozone, with the near death of the oceans, as of right now, we have approximately 40 years worth of oxygen left in our atmosphere. 3,500 years ago, the oxygen content on our planet was 35%, oxygen being a gas. Because of industrialization, pollution, we are right now at less than 18%. And if any of you have taken a physics class, anatomy class, then you know or you remember biology class that the human species needs at least 15% oxygen in order to survive on the surface. Here's where we are right now. And half the pollutants have not reached the ozone level yet. That's number one. Okay? Now, everything here can change, but it starts right here. Number two, what we've got is we have a very strong extraterrestrial presence, even though most of the people aren't aware of it. For example, our moon. The moon was brought here 12,000 years ago. Our moon is, in fact, an artificial satellite. It is not a real planet. It can literally leave our orbit underneath its own power. According to the Andromedans, it was brought here from Ursa Minor, from a star system called Chauta, that had 21 planets in it. It belonged to the 17th planet, and it was one of four moons. Now, there are ruins all over it. The map is there. There are some pictures there. There's a lot more, which but it will be coming out. This is why the Apollo astronauts stopped going back. It's because we were there was somebody already there and they were told not to go back. This information is out there. Okay, our moon is 9.1 billion years old. 9.1 billion years old. It is in fact older than the Earth. Okay, it is. Many of the materials that are, have been found on the moon, minerals, don't exist on our planet. The moon did not belong to part of the Earth. It was brought here, literally. Our solar system has eight artificial moons in it that were brought here. They can literally, underneath their own power, leave our solar system. And there are beings living on it. Now. The upper echelon, the world government, know this. They've known it for a very long time. But they didn't want us to know because of the element of power. And we'll discuss that. Now, Earth has been colonized for off and on for many hundreds of millions of years. The first race to actually chart our planet was a group from Alpha Draconis. They are reptilian beings. 
They're anywhere from 7 feet to 22 feet tall and can weigh up to 1,800 pounds. And they don't like human beings. Not here, not anywhere. They were the very first to chart it. They were also the very first to actually have a small colony here 809 million years ago. Now, one of the very first colonies or places that was colonized on the planet is North America, what we now call the United States. There are approximately, today, 1,800 and 33 of these reptilians still existing inside the planet. They have lived here for thousands of years. They live thousands of years. Their bodies are not like ours. They live anywhere from 100 to 200 miles beneath the surface. This is where they are. And it's all over. The planet is honeycombed with tunnels and caverns. There are approximately 18,000 what we know as greys between here and our moon, from underneath our, the surface of the planet and the moon. Now, the greys. The greys originally came from Zeta Reticuli 2 giving you the Andromedan perspective. I'm not here to challenge anybody else's information. I'm here to tell you their perspective. The Greys came from Zeta Reticuli II. They left there 892,000 years ago. They got trapped in a war called the Orion War, which lasted 600,000 years. It was a galactic war between reptilian forces and human beings. What happened was they were captured by a group in Orion, the constellation of Orion, which is Rigel, Beltrax, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. They were genetically altered there. Many of the female of their species were killed, so they could not reproduce so they could control the race. They also genetically altered them so that their sexual organs would become atrophied and eventually they just wouldn't be there because they weren't being used. Now, the greys, at the same time this was going on, decided that the emotional part of themselves, of their personality, was their weakest link. So they literally bred or thought out the emotional part of their bodies, of their character which is why they have no emotion. They're robots. Today, there are approximately, there are approximately 2,100 actual grays, actual physical grays, that have a soul that are part of the original race, the lineage of the original race, in our solar system. All the rest, virtually every single one that are doing the abductions on people are clones. They're robots. They're not. They don't have an essence. They don't have a soul in them. They're robots. Does everybody follow me so far? Okay. The greys have a problem. They're dying. This is why they basically are here. Now we, as a planetary race, offer them a great opportunity to possibly save their race, but it isn't working. And I'll explain why that is. The greys themselves, however, um, have two agendas, at least two agendas. One is to save their race, and the other is to try to help us evolve. Now, I know how that sounds, but let me explain to you the position that they're in and how it's been related to me. The greys are controlled by a group in Orion. Now, the Orion group is made up of nine different races. They are dark. There are some in Orion that are light. But those that are here are dark. They are regressive. They're into control, domination. They do not want 
us to evolve. And I'll explain why that is, because we hold a polarity of third density. Third density in our spectrum of our universe was an experiment. We are an experiment. But as long as we hold the polarity of third density, they are in control of third density. If we evolve to four and to five density, there's no longer a third density. Does everybody follow me? Everything becomes light, which is what it originally was. It doesn't become this. It becomes light, even though it is light now. It vibrates at such a low frequency that it's absolute solid matter. There's a lot of us in the universe stuck in third density. We were not supposed to be in this position, in this density, this long. Many have got addicted to third density, to the physicality of it, to the idea of, of, if you'll pardon my expression, a sexual orgasm in third density, forgetting what it's like to have a spiritual type of an experience, which is similar to it. Now, here's what happened. The greys are not only doing this in our system, but this is also going on in 23 other systems in our galaxy. The same scenario, but it's not quite as bad as it is here. Now, the Greys have been con totally controlled by the Orions. Since they're dying, there's literally no chance of them breaking free. In other words, they have nowhere to go. The only chance they have to break free from the Orion group is if we evolve. Because if we evolve, this being the neutral point, this being absolute positivity, this being absolute negativity, we are approximately halfway here. If we can evolve, it's not a question of just moving this way any longer. Because everything is in balance. Everything is a polarity. No matter how far you go into the dark, when you flip, you go exactly the same place to the light. So, if we rotate, if we can evolve, if we make the decision to evolve, we will literally move to this position here. Literally changing everything in the middle. Just like that. We will have an effect on everything in our galaxy. Everything. Now, there are wars breaking out all over our galaxy. Apparently, the Andromedans, the Pleiadians, a group from Cirrusae, Arcturians, and a group from Tau Ceti, Tau Ceti, did a study or some kind of a research project. And they decided the quickest way to resolve all of these conflicts was to change the vibration of our solar system. Because our solar system holds the polarity of war. And that doesn't mean we're at fault and we created those other things, because we didn't. But we hold the polarity. Does everybody follow that? Everybody explain. If you don't understand, speak. I'm easy to talk to. Okay, we hold the polarity of war. We war with ourselves, we war with each other, we war with other countries. This doesn't exist on a lot of other planets. We're very unique in that way. Okay, I'm going to assume that you all understand. Now, there are 141 Orion Group members here as well. There are also 17 extraterrestrials from Cirrus B. Now, how many are familiar? Are, how many of you are familiar with the Montauk information, Montauk Project, time travel, front and back? Okay. According to the Andromedans, that technology was given to our government by the Syrians. Not Cirrus A, Cirrus B. 
Just because they fly around in these really awesome spaceships doesn't mean that they have, they come from an unconditional love space. We will all be awed by the technology. Do not be awed by the beings that are flying it. Do not. They are absolutely no better than you. They're just not. Because as souls, we were all created at the same time. We're just on different levels on an evolutionary scale in the physical. But on a soul level, we're all the same. Okay, that's important, please, because in the next five years, you're going to have absolute proof. Um, any questions so far? How does our government line up with each one of these groups? Excellent. Excellent question. Okay. Our government, well, let me start with World War II. Right. Actually, we'll start in the 1930s. The world government. Okay, the world government. Okay, there is a world government. It controls all of our lives through the media, militarily, and of course, the big thing, money because they've got us all believing we have to have money to survive. Okay? And that's a belief system. You've got to have money to survive. It's a belief system. But we're all there. We're all in it. We're all participating in that belief system. Okay, you've got, essentially, the Draconans, I'll just put Drax for short, believe that this planet and this solar system belongs to them because they were the first to chart it. They also believe that because they were the first to chart our planet, that they own the planet and everything else on it. Which right now is us. <clears throat> Underneath them is the Orions. They do the dirty work for the Drax. There is a hierarchy. Just like in any government, there's a hierarchy. Even the dark forces are organized in a hierarchy, in a hierarchical government. Underneath them are many different groups, but we'll deal specifically with the Greys because that's what we're dealing with. The Greys were the first to make contact with our government. Our government. However, the Greys in 1931 also made contact, before they made contact with our government, with the Germans, with the Nazis. But the Germans told them, go away. We're already in contact with extraterrestrials. And those extraterrestrials were the Giza intelligence. Does everybody know who they are? They were a renegade group of Pleiadians who believed in the Aryan philosophy, of which that's most of our lineages, the white race, being superior to all the others. Okay, that's where that, that that's where that was born out of. Yeah. Okay, extraterrestrial. That's where it came from. Everything we everything we virtually know about ourselves, we've been taught. We copied the gods, the the mythological gods, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Sumeria, the gods of Babylon, the gods of Atlantis. We just emulated them. We're great copiers, and we saw how they treated each other and how they treated us. And we've just emulated it and passed it on legacy after legacy. So it was, uh, do we just continue to pass it on? And now we're at a point where we're either going to destroy ourselves or we're going to evolve. We've literally put ourselves right here in the corner. Literally, as a planetary race. Okay, now, Pleiadians, to their credit, got rid of Giza intelligence. But they were not in a position to get rid of the Greys. And the reason they were not in a position to get rid of the Greys is because a group within our government signed a treaty. So the researchers who did this, who have come up with this information, are to be congratulated for, for the research that they've done. Okay? Much of this information I've been able to collaborate and say yes, they've said yes, it's true, or no, it's not, it's this information. Okay? And I help to fill in the gaps, but I don't have all the answers either. Now, everybody
Everybody follow me to this point? Okay. The Roswell crash did in fact occur. It wasn't the only one. There have been many all over North America and Canada. A lot of them you haven't heard anything about. Now, when World War II was over, many of, of those that were involved in the spy network, the intelligent net network of Germany, including their scientists, were brought to the United States. Many went to Russia. Those that were brought here had information and had dealings with Giza intelligence. So they had a familiarity with the extraterrestrial phenomenon. Now first, there was the OSS. Then the OSS became the CIA. Then Truman created the NSA, the National Security Agency. How many of you don't know what that is? I'm not talking about the National Security Council. I'm talking about the National Security Agency. Okay. And I'm going to assume that you all know. The NSA is exempt from all laws in the United States unless it is specifically mentioned in the law. Bill Cooper talks about this as well. It's a reality. It's a reality. You pay the bills. But you have no say about anything that they do. None whatsoever. This group right here is your secret government. Clinton is a janitor. He's a puppet. He's a puppet. He does what he's told. When they say jump, he says how high. Literally. Because they are in contact with the extraterrestrials. They have the technology. And they have the clout. Because when you take the NSA, which has all this extraterrestrial technology and information, and you couple it with the world bankers, you got a tyranny. You got a tyranny. And that's basically where we're almost at. In fact, we've been, over, we've been living under it for some time. They just haven't been real blatant about it. All right, now, in the NSA, there are four top secret levels. There's the black monks. This group here is the priesthood. Remember the, the legends of Samaria and Egypt? There was the gods. And there was the priesthoods. The priesthoods went into the masses and made sure that whatever the gods wanted was fulfilled. It was done. They carried out the format, the program, whatever it was. Okay? That's what the black monks are. It's the new priesthood. Then you've got the blue moon unit. The blue moon unit is who controls the three military bases on the moon. They were also the same group that established the two colonies on Mars, which are called Adam and Eve. All of that, that went, that's on Mars, went there from the moon. And I'll describe how that all happened. Then you've got the Ultra, one unit. Then you have Ultra, two. Now, according to the Andromedans, what we've all, or what many people in the UFO circle believe is MJ-12, being the secret government, it is in fact, according to the Andromedans, Ultra 2. It's the lowest rung of the ladder. And if any of you have ever been in the military, this is the way they do things. I myself have not. But I've, I've, I've researched it enough to know that it's, what the way it appears isn't what it is. And then, You've got the rest of us, what we call our government. Washington, D.C., and the military, etc. On and on and on. Now, free energy devices, all of this technology has been in existence over 60 years. 
We literally have not had to pump a gallon of, of oil, a barrel of oil, out of the ground in 60 years. Technology's been available. It's all being used on the moon, and it was being used on Mars. We don't have it here at all. Now they're starting to come out with it because you know, the, the atmosphere is screwed. All right. Any questions on this so far? I'm giving you a real quick, you know, right to the point, right to the bone synopsis here. Somebody has a question. <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> okay, well. In the overall picture of it, what, is, what are the various groups jockeying for position four? What are they trying to gain out of it? Obviously, they have a goal. They all have different agendas. I don't know specifically outside of control and domination and the fact that they would like to keep the third density vibration on a universal scale from evolving what the Orions and the Draconians want. I can tell you about the Greys though. Okay. Now, and even the, even the benevolent forces. And that's where we come in. Why so much attention to planet Earth? Why us? We're this little speck. We're this little speck on the outs, outskirts of the galaxy. We're just this little, little solar system. Well, galactic and intergalactic travel has existed in our universe for 4.4 billion years. Now I'm dealing with linear time because that's the only way I know how to put it. Many of the extraterrestrial groups that were leaving from their respective star systems, when they would pass through our sector of our galaxy, they would always stop here on Earth. Why? It's beautiful. It's got an abundance of water, which is very rare in our galaxy. It has vegetation and life forms, unlike most other places. And not only that, it was far enough away that they could literally do anything they wanted, and nobody would say anything. It was like a retreat. And they would fly through here, stay 50 years, which is, in a, if you live a lifespan of several thousand years, it's just a weekend. You know, even though it's 50 years to us, it's almost a lifetime. And they would just play God. Genetically alter this, genetically alter that. They would pick up other life forms as they were exploring. They would drop them off and see if they would evolve here, if they could exist. They tinkered. They did all kinds of things. Now, ETs don't value gold and silver or diamonds. They're not into that. What they're into are genetics. That's their valuables, life forms. And we're, we're now moving in that direction ourselves, our scientists. OK. Well, what's happened is, according to the Andromedans, we have, we, us, Parents, earth human beings, the physical forms that we now have ourselves is a direct result of the genetic manipulation of at least 22 different races, extraterrestrial races who tinkered with us. This is why we have approximately 22 different body types on the planet. Now what I'm talking about body types, different physical and genetic and chemical structure, structural makeups on the, on the planet. There are 22. This is why we have so many different races that have different physical features. Now, because of this manipulation, what's happened is that we, as a planetary race, have become this, like Heinz 57. We have inside of us the genetic as well as racial memories of at least 22 different extraterrestrial races. Which means that we can physically bond or um, give birth or create with almost any specific species out there with exception of the greys. Well, actually, to some degree, we can with the greys and the insectoid races. We can't mate with them. But we can with almost any other form, including reptilian. Just a few alterations in our DNA and it's done. We're the only ones. Now, 
This is also the only planet in our galaxy where you have so many different races together. Now what's happened, and I'll give the example of Andromeda. The Andromedans are a human race, but they have been so pure, so clean on their DNA, in their genetic melding with, with the same race, that they are now starting to see signs of genetic breakup. In other words, the line is starting to show some genetic weakness. The Pleiades will experience this in a million years. They will start to see it. The Greys are already experiencing it. And there are other races as well, primarily human races, where this is happening, where the genetic material is starting to break down because of so much interbreeding within the same race, the same family. Follow me so far? There's only one race that can add this genetic boost, the new genetic material to help them, and it's us. But they can't use our DNA, they can't use our physical structures because of our consciousness. We vibrate at such a low level. They can't use it. Plus, they just can't come down here and steal it like the Greys did because it's a violation of free will which is the number one law. Do not violate free will. Number two, do not interfere or intervene with an evolving race unless you are asked. Of course, we have been. We have been for the last 5,000 years. Majorly manipulated as a planetary race. So, this is why there's so much attention here. Now, the, the negatives, the negative forces, and I include the world government in this, are doing everything they can to keep us down, to keep us negative, to keep us divided, warring with each other, all of that. They're doing an excellent job. The benevolent ones, however, want us to come together as a race. They want us to move into an unconditional love or an unconditional responsibility space. But they have to do it in such a way that we think it's our idea. Because they can't violate our free will. Does everybody follow that so far? So, it's a hell of a situation. It's really complicated. I wish I could say it's, it's black and white, and there it is, but it isn't. It's a very complicated thing. Now, because of the gray intervention, and because our government, basically, the secret government, sold us out, it has forced all of us to evolve now, instead of on a planetary level, on an individual level. Where each one has got, each one of us has to go inside, and we have to look at ourselves and say, who the hell am I? What am I doing with my life? Is this really what I want to do? Am I really happy with all this? And these are tough, tough questions. Any questions so far? Okay, now, the Andromedans look at the fact that we are the sum total of 22 extraterrestrial races. They also look at the idea that we are spirit, essence. They literally look at us as being royalty, because we're the only ones like this. They think we are royalty. And every time I say that, I get chills. Isn't that awesome? That's the best kept secret on the planet. We're royalty. We don't act like it, but we are. Now, how unique are we? Okay, we're royalty. We live on a planet that's dying, and yet our race continues to propagate. We continue to over to populate. They're like in awe. The Pleiadians can't come down here and live here. The Andromedans can't. The Draconans and the Reptilians can only live underground. They can't live on the surface because it's so polluted. And yet here we are, part of the same human family, and we just continue to move on. We're so strong. It's amazing. When you look at that, and you look at our extremes in emotion, positive to negative, 
happy to depression, love to sadness. When you look at the extremes, where again, this is where we're unique, we're the only ones that have this extreme swing in emotions. Now, our emotions is our biggest strength. Because when you pray or you meditate and you want to create something in your life, it's one thing to picture it. But the real secret is when you put emotion behind it, you create it. You literally create it. Emotion is what puts it into swing. Emotion is what attracts it to you. Now, the planet's very negative. The consciousness is very negative. If we were to change that overnight, the planet would change. This is our strength, but we've got to stop using it against each other. Because the bottom line is, all we have is each other. You know, your checking account, your American Express card is not going to get you to Mars. It's not going to get you on a mothership. You know, all we have is each other. Because we don't have another home. Ashtar is not coming to save you. It isn't going to happen. So don't pack your bags. Okay. Any questions? Yes? Is there a concern that says that our destiny, one way or the other, in the end, wouldn't really be of much concern to them? Or is that just the opposite? They're very concerned about what would happen to humans? They're very concerned with what happened to us because we're unique. We are part of everything. Okay? We literally are connected to 22 different races. We literally off we can offer them a genetic pool that they don't that they need that they can't get anywhere else. There's also the fact that in the process, if if we were to destroy ourselves, we would destroy the planet. There's also a possibility the planet itself could self-destruct. I mean, literally just blow itself apart because of the negativity. Now, let's look at that concept. Okay? This is the Earth. If the Earth explodes, what happens to the other planets in our solar system? Their rotations will change around the sun. Okay? Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, they will all start to move in because the gravitational pull is set up like a mechanism. If it's not there, they will literally change their orbit. Okay, our solar system could completely implode or implode maybe several hundred million miles. Now the slack has to be picked up someplace else. Now our solar system is gravitationally connected to the dog star, to Cirrus A. Cirrus A evolves around Alcyon. So the whole galaxy moves like a Swiss watch. And our galaxy is continuously moving throughout the universe. Well, if it implodes, if our solar system implodes, somewhere down the line, someplace, Another solar system is going to have to move and adjust its course, its track, its rotation to fill in the slack. Does everybody follow that? And we will be responsible for not only destroying ourselves and our planet, but possibly killing billions and billions of other life forms we don't even know exist. And they're not about to let us do that without taking some kind of an action. But they truly believe that we can change this. Yes. Is it true that the uh, planet X, uh, that uh, Zachary Sitchin talks about, the 12th planet is coming into our solar system? And uh, I've heard uh, several, I've been to several UFO conferences and people have spoken about that. that uh, is there a 12th planet? Yeah, is <laughs> yes, there is. In fact, there's a 13th as well, <laughs> according to the Andromedans. There's one that's trailing behind that. Uh, is that going to affect uh, the Earth at all? A couple hundred years from now. Oh, I see. 250 years, I think, to be exact, or a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. When you start out, um, you said to uh, to understand that um, within, I think you said the end of this year or the next year, there will be dramatic changes. Can you kind of be more specific in, in those changes? Sure. Did everybody hear the question? Okay, about changes? <clears throat> According to the Andromedans, I'm going to deal with planetary things. There is a possibility by, that sometime by the end of May, a part of Japan will sink. It will and not this be in, May. This May. It will not be an accident. It will be created. Bye by the world government, because the Japanese will not move into the world banking government, because in order to do that, they have to sell out their people. And they're not going to do it. They refuse to so far to do it. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. They've also said, and, I, and this was a year and a half ago, that by the end of this May, Bill Clinton will have to resign. He would not finish his presidency. They have not said anything to the effect to alter that. But the way things are looking, I, I don't think that that's going to happen by the end of May. I Maybe September. It'll happen. Because of stuff that goes on, that went on in uh, Arkansas, Mina, and all that. But that's a whole other situation. Is he not cooperating probably, or what? Who? Clinton? Yeah. Um, no, it, it involves, well... He looks like a willing slave. You know, I don't know exactly what that end of it is, but I know that the lawsuit that is bringing, that's probably going to bring him down, involves the guy who wrote the book Compromised, Terry Reed, I think his name is. And uh, in fact, this lawsuit literally reopens the Iran Contra affair because they have film footage, video footage apparently, of Bill Clinton and Oliver North standing next to an airplane as they're unloading. And, uh, and also in this book, it makes reference to the fact that they, the IRS has been able to track anywhere between 30 to $50 million to the Cayman Islands, to a bank account in the Cayman Islands that belongs to Bill and Hillary. Anyway, there's a lot, but I don't, I don't want to get focused on that. There's a lot. He, he makes George Bush the next Boy Scout, which is very hard to do. Um, okay. As far as our country, some of the things that they have said that are going to occur absolutely by 1996 is expected change in the currency. They've already said it. This October of this year, which is our government's fiscal year, 1995, $2.3 trillion of our national debt is due and payable. We don't have it. It's real simple. We don't have it. The reason we don't have it is because we don't print our own currency. And every year we have to borrow more money to run the government. Does everybody follow that? Okay. This is why the dollar's dropping. It's just, it's change. It's time for change. And it's a good thing because any corrupt system does eventually collapse on itself. Um, there's also a possibility that by the end of the year, and it could be triggered by this financial crisis, that the President of the United States, whether it's Gore or whoever it's going to be, um, will declare a state of emergency. Now, how many are you familiar with Executive Order 11490? signed by Richard Nixon in 1972. Okay, it was a list of 23 executive orders which essentially say that in a declared national emergency they can suspend the Constitution up to five years and they send Congress home for six months. Okay, the scary thing is it doesn't necessarily state in the law, the executive order, what the national emergency has to be. All he has to do is declare it. And they've also divided now, Jimmy Carter took that executive order, and that in turn 
in turn, when he signed that, he gave all regulatory power under these executive orders to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Act. FEMA then created a program, which is now law, um, which was signed by George Bush, putting, separating the United States into 10 federal regions. So the plan possibly is to suspend the Constitution and then to split the states up into federal regions so that we can all come back together and the United States of America, as we know, it, will cease to exist unless the people rebel and take it back. Yes. Yes. I think they've grossly underestimated the people. Now, in 1992, Bill Clinton signed another executive order recognizing the UN Charter as the law of the land. Technically, we no longer have the Constitution as the abiding law of the land. In 1992, it became the United Nations Charter, which is why the United Nations is sending our troops and dictating where our military troops go. It's because of this action. So there's a lot going on. And all of this is being manipulated by the extraterrestrials. They want to take control. They want to implant everyone. Because if they implant you, it's a sign of ownership. It's a stamp of ownership. The implant is. The other races don't have implants. You know. The government's trying to feed people the fact that we have to blend with the grades in order to, to move into a higher dimension, to evolve. I've even heard this in UFO circles. It's absolutely ludicrous. All the other human races are doing it without becoming part of an alien race, a plant. Now, are there any more questions on this before I change the subject? Yes, sir. Yeah, the plant right there, when, uh, was that, when was that brought into existence? Planet Earth? Yeah. Planet Earth Why? is 7.1 billion years old. According to them. That's when it became a physical mass. Okay? It actually started, I don't know, about 640 billion years ago with being with a gas, starting to form as gas in particles. And it took this amount of time before it became physical mass. Just designed this way, or just happened random, or it happened randomly. But a lot of the genetic life forms, plant plant life, sea life, human life, primate life, a lot of that was brought here. It was also brought to Mars. Apparently, Mars and Earth were almost ident were identical 70 million years ago. But Mars went through a, a huge catastrophe 69 million years ago. Um, and even went through another war a million years ago. The ruins on Mars and all that, they're, they're, some of them are 65, 70, 80, 100 million years old. The face and all that is at least a million years old. Now, according to the Andromedans, the face belongs to a group of Orions. That complex was built by Orions. The pyramids were built by Orions. Now, I understand that there's all kinds of coding and uh, geometrics that go with the pyramids, but according to the Andromedans, and this is something they've done in the past, and many other races do, when they find a planet that they want to inhabit it or colonize, and its wobble is so irregular that they can't build anything on it because they don't know 1,000 one years to the next whether or not it's going to be destroyed, what they will do to balance the rotation the orbit of the planet is put weights on it, like we do with our car tire. These weights are the pyramids. They put them at strategic locations to balance the rotation. This is why the Great Pyramid of Giza is located exactly dead center of all the mass planet, uh, Earth mass on the planet. It's a weight. That's what it was originally designed to be, was a weight to balance our rotation. So it, they would have some semblance of order here, that they wouldn't have to worry about it flipping around and orbiting and pole shifting whenever it wanted to, or wobbling so much like this, you know, that the oceans would just change. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, pyramids on 
and earth are uh, located in the same part of the hemisphere as the pyramids on Mars? Yes. Yes, it is. But there are more pyramids on the earth than there are on Mars. There are a lot in the ocean. <clears throat> you know, Central America. Right. We have a lot. Of course, it's, you know, almost one and a half times the land mass as well. Plus, we have water, which in itself is an incredible amount of weight. I think we have one, 1 1.2 trillion miles, square miles of water on the planet. Which is phenomenal. You know, absolutely phenomenal. Two -thirds of the earth. It's two thirds of the earth. And less and less than one percent is drinkable. Another question. Somebody asked, yes sir. Can you give us some back some of your background and how you came into all this information and et cetera, et cetera? Yes. I guess it's time for that. Um, my contact started when I was eight years old. I was um, on a family picnic, picnic in Woodstock, Michigan, which is in the upper northern peninsula. Um, I did not remember the contact until I was eight, at the age of 14. Um, I knew and my parents knew that something had happened and the other folks. Uh, we went out to play hide and go seek. And uh, the grass was very tall. It was in August. It was like the second or third week of August, just before we all went back to school. And uh, I went to lay down in the tall grass and just to hide, okay? Because we had one of our little cousins, she was a, a female, you know, we made her red, so she had to go around and find us. And I remember picking up the chestnuts and throwing them because they were chestnuts. And I made a place for me to lay down. Well, I fell asleep. When I woke up, it was night. It was close to nine o'clock. Now in August, you know, the sun sets late. So I got up and I walked back. I'm approximately 250, maybe 300 yards from, from the picnic area. There was a police car there, there was a dog in the back, or a state police, I think it was, state trooper, because the guy had the big round hat with the, the funny thing on the top. Um, when I got back, at first they were all glad to see me, and then my mother walloped me. She gave me a spanking. Where have you been? And I said, well, I was over there. No, you weren't. We were all looking for you. So I took them back with flashlights to where I was, and sure enough, there was my imprint in the grass, and they swore up and down that they had been all through there, and I wasn't there. It wasn't until age 14 that I realized what had happened. And I was asleep. We were living in, in uh, Elk Grove Village, Illinois. And uh, I was asleep, and I woke up, and I'm lying on a table, flat on my back, and I'm looking up at this light. And there's a very tall, big guy standing next to me, and a short, tiny one. The tiny one had white skin, bald head, looked sort of oriental, but he wasn't, just very old. And the other guy, the big tall one, was light blue skinned, no hair, but built like a Greek god, like this. <coughs> I had instantaneous recognition of those two guys, two men. The tall one is Morinet. He's 2,300 years old in our time. He's from Andromeda. The short one was Phaseus. Now, they don't use names like we use names, but those are names that they gave me so that I could call them to accommodate me. That's how I relate to them. They use symbols. Phaseus is 4,300 years old. Actually, he's older, <clears throat> but that's his approximate age. Um, they're incredible. They're absolutely incredible. They're human beings, just like us. They evolved. Uh, they were part of the Lyran lineage of the human race. And Lyra itself was destroyed in a war, and everybody just scattered and migrated out to survive. And according to them, and this is probably a good time I want to add this before I get, I forget, they say the Andromedans, based on stories that the ancient Draconians have recorded, that the human race was created by another race called the Patal. They have no idea where the Patals are. The human lineage, we have no recording of this, but the Draconans have legends of this because the Draconans then were warring against the Patal. And the Patal was constantly trying to protect this small band, and based on the description, it's the human race. But nobody knows how many millions or billions of years ago that was. 
So um, it started at, at age 14. I was taken on the ship. I was given a physical uh, that recorded my brain waves, my biorhythms, so that I could be communicated or contacted no matter where I was in, the, in, in our galaxy or wherever they were in the galaxy. I'm, I'm always stuck here. Um, they put me on a brain scanner device. Uh, the room, the room that I was in was completely round. This was when you were 8 or 14? Age 14. Okay. There was a table in the middle, that's all that was there. Now Warren A had like a little clicker, you know like a cable box clicker? You know when you want to change the channel? It was a device similar to that. He would just push a button and literally on the walls all of these meters and telemeters and gauges would literally manifest out of nowhere. Out of, a, out of a, an absolute wall like this. Suddenly there were gauges and knobs recording everything about my physical body. Everything. <clears throat> they put a little cap on my head. It was like a yarmulke except the top of it was cut out. They put it on my head and he pointed and he said, look, telepathically. And I looked and another scanner, like a television, appeared on the wall and it literally I started seeing pictures, like clips from movies, just going by. Boom, 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 boom. Different scenes. And I kept recognizing the main character in these scenes. It was me. It was my entire reincarnational history on the earth. Flashing before me. Not the whole life, but scenes of it. Of who I was. When this was done, they gave me a little cup, and it was like water. And he said, drink it. So I drank it, and they turned around and they watched. On a meter here, they could see it go all the way down. It looked like water, tasted like water, but on a monitor, it was blue. And you could see it go all the way down into my organs. And every time I go on board, they give me a physical. And it's because of the environment we live in. Now, when this was done, I got up off the table. All the monitors literally disappeared again. Now there's nothing there but wall. We, they start to walk this way. I get up off the table and I'm standing there. The stage turns around and says, you know, like this. He says, follow. So I started to walk with them. I turn around. The table is gone. Now it's not there. So I said, how did you do that? And Morinay said, we manipulated third density so you could have a place to lay. And that's when they started to explain to me that everything is a holograph. The universe, you, me, everything is a holographic projection. And what they do is they use extensively, they use extensively holographic technology. And they can literally create anything in third density because all it is is an idea and vibration. And they literally can create it. How come they can't create a race of beings like us with the genetics that we have that they want to preserve so badly? Because the spirit factor can't create spirit. That only comes from one source. That's God. That's the gift. You can create a physical form, but you cannot create, recreate spirit. And if you create a physical form, unless it's divinely ordained, you can't put a spirit into it. This is the problem the grace have. They have created their hybrids, but they can't get a soul to incarnate in it. It's just flesh. That's all it is. And they have to artificially keep it alive. Because there's no soul in it. Remember when you went in at, at 14, you'd remember that you had um, seen them at 8. Had you been talking to them during that time frame? And when you met with them again at 14, was it been familiar with you? Was it comfortable? Or was it frightening? What were they? I had absolutely no fear whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And no, I didn't talk to them. I so just you, basically from forgot. 8 to 40, right. And then I 14, right. they, from 14 they on. Did you contact you again I had, at that point? I had three contacts. During the age of 14. So the 
last one. If 14 there's nothing, then a 14. Right. On the last one, I was told about certain events that would occur in my life. And not to feel forsaken. I had one more contact at 16, but I was asleep. I was never awakened for it, and it was just a physical examination. Now, at 16, I was living in Pound Ridge, New York, which is upstate. It's near Stanford, Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut, in that area, but still in New York State. Near Bedford, Mount Kisco, if anybody knows that area. North of White Plains, up in that area. Then there was nothing. Now, I have total memory of these three contacts and what I saw, and everything. There was nothing. Until 1985, I had a tax practice in Beverly Hills, and I moved to a 700-acre horse ranch in Malibu, in the Malibu Mountains, Santa Monica Mountains. And in 1985, it started. I started having the dreams. I had a lot of recurrences. I had a, uh, I had a meditation with a roommate up at our house in Malibu. And it was in 1987, I'm sorry, 1985, 1986, when we, it was that time where we had three huge rainstorms that came in just days apart from each other, and half of Malibu was washed out. That happens every time it rains. Um, but anyway, we had this meditation, and 22 people showed up. And we were inside uh, meditating. Uh, it was great. We were there for about an hour, hour and a half, and then we decided to take a break. Well, two brothers went outside, James and I can't remember the other brother's name, they went outside to have a cigarette, because we didn't allow smoking in the house. So they went outside, and suddenly James runs back in the house, screaming, oh my God, you got to see this, you got to see this. So we all start going outside, now it's mud, you know, because it's a ranch. And you look up, and up in the sky, there was a complete circle of open space. And inside the circle were 11 stars, like this. I got 22 witnesses to this. Okay? There were 11 stars. So we all start to hold hands. And we start to meditate now outside. Well, as we formed the circle, the stars started to change. And what they did was they moved and they formed a straight line. Just like this. Now, there are people there that started to cry, grown men. You know, one guy was, oh my God, this is my first sighting. 17 years I've been into this. This is the first time I've seen a <laughs> UFO. And there are these stars moving all over the sky in this one clear space of sky. Well, they suddenly started to spread apart like this and form the circle again. Okay? However, one in the middle stayed. One state in the middle. Now, directly across from me, there was a gentleman by the name of Bill Jones. He was in Canoga Park, California. <clears throat> William Jones. He was an army photographer. He was in Laos. Worked with intelligence during Vietnam. He opened his mouth, and before he could even finish saying what his thought was, the one in the middle started to move. He said, why don't we ask the one in the middle to do a figure eight. Well, before he could even finish his sentence, the one in the middle did a lazy figure eight. Now, almost everybody was crying. And just as quick as this was open, it just went and it ended, just like that. And I gotta tell you folks, those 22 people scattered, boom, like this. You know, you turn on the light in a restaurant and you got roaches on the floor, you turn on that light and they scatter, people left like, they were gone, just like that. It was intense. It was really, really intense. And that's when the contact started. Uh, a few nights later, I woke up. I had this incredible desire to go hiking. And if you know any, if you know that area at all, Santa Monica Mountains, you can hike anywhere. There's not a lot of homes. And I grabbed the dog. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. It was a full moon. And I went to this area off of uh, Mulholland Highway. Um, Walked on the trail, had my flashlight in case I needed it, my pack with water, and the dogs, and we come around this bend, and there's Faseus standing in the pathway. And that's when the contact started all over again. And they've been consistent since then. They've even been physical, either physical or telepathic. As far as physicals, I've had over 187 physical contacts. The 
The last two months I've had four, and they've all been telepathic. Do you know if anybody else in that group would have con has had contacts and so on? I don't know. I don't know. I know that Viseas and Mornay are talking to four people on Earth. There's one in North America, which I assume is me. There's one in South America. There's one in Asia and one in Europe. And they're just one group that's contacting the Earth. The Pleiadians are, the Syrians are, the uh, Arcturians are, a group from Tau Ceti is. There are other groups that are contacting different people. Yes, sir? One of the, uh, you read a lot of articles about these aliens at the, the White House, you know. You mean like the, the little the rag magazines? <laughs> yeah, the time, you know, you see all these, you know, these people being uh, pulled out of, you know, other contacts, other people are claiming that they have been launched. I honestly don't believe. I honestly don't believe that the White House, the President of the United States, has ever met an alien, um, a live alien. Um, I think Richard Nixon, well, George Bush, obviously, because of his connect, having been director of the CIA. But I think Richard Nixon was really, other than George Bush, the only real president that knew anything. I think Reagan knew a tiny bit. But you got to understand that most of that. Alien information is classified, my understanding is Q6 or above. The president is a Q5. He can't even go to Area 51. His security clearance isn't high enough for the president to go to Area 51 in Nevada. Now, Richard Nixon, and this is in Jackie Gleason's autobiography, was playing golf with a great one, Jackie Gleason. And Apparently they had a few drinks or a few cigars, and anyway, they got into the limous limousine and he took Jackie Gleason to Hempstead Air Force Base in Florida. And he took him to an unmarked hangar, they went downstairs several floors, and he actually showed Jackie Gleason in a cryogenic storage the bodies of four aliens. And Jackie Gleason has this in his autobiography. And where I found this out was on one of those airline magazines on American Airlines. <laughs> You know, so it's out there, little bits and pieces. You know, they're trying to, one portion of the government is trying to tell people, just like this article here, you know, regarding Mars. You know, we're told for years that it's 95% carbon dioxide, tiny bit of oxygen, can't live there, very hostile, all this stuff. When here, here this article dated uh, Thursday, March 23rd, 1985, it admits that in 1971 they, that they knew the atmosphere of Mars was rich in ozone. Ozone is O3, that's oxygen. Every spring we see the north and south polar caps of Mars melt. They admit it's water. But in the next breath they say, well, the temperature never gets more than 40 degrees <coughs> below zero. Well, how does water melt at 40 degrees below zero? Impossible. So it obviously gets above freezing if they see it melt. And since there's ozone, there's absolutely an atmosphere. So there are all these little subtle things, you know, and that if we're not paying attention, none of it makes any sense. Now, the big problem here with our government coming clean with the alien information is, okay, one, it's the fallout. They've lied to us. It's the number one thing, but nobody would be surprised by that, really. The other thing is, you know, then, then the real questions start. Well, what kind of information do you have? What kind of technology do we have? Well, well, God, we built these 53 UFO craft. You did? Let me see. Boom, there they are. How did you pay for these things? Um, well, that's sticky. The sale of drugs. <clears throat> that's how they've been building these things. Some of it came from black ops money, but a lot of it came from the sale of drugs. And I don't think anybody on the planet doesn't know that the CIA is doing this. And the minute things where she would be afraid of you. Right. And the minute they come out with this, what do you think is going to happen in the streets when people find out that the drug problem, the drug war, that we can't win is our own government doing it? Whoops. Civil war. It'll happen overnight. Overnight. The police will be the first ones to, you know. I mean, they're out there in the streets right. every day dealing with this, this energy, getting shot by drug addicts. 
by pushers, by the whole shebang, you know, and something they can't win because it's our government bringing this stuff in. We have AWACS, satellites, Coast Guard, Air Force, Navy, Border Patrol. You can't get a mosquito in here unless it's supposed to be here. Bottom line. Yes, you, you. Um, when is the, uh, the effect on religion be more? If they came out and said, here, we got all this stuff, we've been talking, wouldn't that affect religion more than anything? Cause more chaos than, they say, you're selling drugs, but just the thought that there are a lot more races out there you were talking to, wouldn't that disrupt religion? Because we're the, you know, we're made God's image, we're the only ones here, supposedly, by most well, you, mean, you mean that lie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not here to offend anybody. You know, they have their own perspective. Um, they basically feel, and I know some of the other extraterrestrial races feel the same way, that our religions have completely outlived, outlived their usefulness um, by 450 years. And that they literally are holding us back from evolving as a planetary race. Um, they, in fact, are governments. That's how they view religions. They're governments. Um, <laughs> their opinion is that Moses is a composite character. That there was a, a soul by the name of Moab and another one by the name of Sorastris, or Sorasistris. Um, and that the actual exodus that we, is in the Bible was the Chaldean exodus. It wasn't the Jewish exodus out of Egypt, but it was just the story was rewritten and changed thousands of years ago. This is their opinion. Just their opinion. You take it for what you want. They also say that the, the, in the New Testament, the hero of the New Testament is also a composite character. And um, to support that, at least part of that, in 1961, the Vatican, during the uh, Second Economical Council, admitted to 14 different plagiarisms in the New Testament. But they would not be specific what the, the plagiarisms were. The Sermon on the Mount um, that is attributed in the New Testament to Jesus. Uh, in a Turkish museum in Istanbul, they have in the handwriting of a Greek senator, the exact same speech, word for word, written by a Greek senator, and it's dated 64 AD, and apparently was given by one by the name of Apollonius of Tyana, who was a Cappadocian sage to the Greek Senate. And apparently the Catholic Church has been trying for about 55 years to get their hands on that. And then there's the Dead Sea Scrolls. They let those out, and now you can't get them again, because it tells a very different story. So there's a lot. There's a lot going on. The bottom line is, though, that we should all try to be Christ-like. And there absolutely positively is a God. Even the negative ones say that. But they call it a mind. But that tells you where they're at. You know, but there is a God. Something created all of this. Yes, sir? That's what I was going to ask you. All these planets and all, but they have a creator? one individual that are claiming, or is it, how do they come to existence? Okay, that's a great question. Can you answer? The Andromedans call God the Isness. They, just like us, just like the Pleiadians, everybody is trying to figure out exactly what God is. Nobody knows, other than the fact that he, she, it exists. According to the Andromedans, if we had to put, um, a gender to it, it would be female. Because God is literally the manifestation of creation. <clears throat> and they say in, in, their, in their teachings that the thought, the idea, is the masculine and the actual birthing of it is the feminine. So, here's what they say is happening. Or how, what they said how our universe came to be. Apparently, every single one of us, including the matter, Almost all the matter that is in our now present universe came from someplace else. 
apparently it came from another universe. And here's what's happened. And, and this is how they taught me. Apparently what's happened is based on, on time, time and space, some other universe, the frequency started to evolve. It sped up and everything started to evolve, except for those things that chose not to evolve. And it is, in fact, a decision. What happened was, as the frequency got higher, those things that were in negativity or fear became very heavy in weight, in frequency. It's like this. Okay, fifth density is in this same room, but we can't see it because it oscillates at a higher frequency. But we all know about third density. What happened was, those things that were third density and other vibrations formed sacs in time and space. And as these frequencies continued to get higher and higher, these got heavier and heavier. Now since God never wastes anything, especially things that are spirit, what happened was, at some point, they broke out of the time-space sack that they were in and literally exploded. Now, in the Andromedan perspective, consciousness is not your thoughts. It's the space in which you are that you create to evolve. That's what consciousness is in their teachings. So literally, these energies, these things that were in these sacks, literally created a space for them to explode into so they can continue to evolve. It's like you take a water balloon, you fill it with water, you take a pin and you pop it, boom, it explodes, all the water comes out. Right? This is exactly the same procedure. Everything that's matter came out of the black holes. Every galaxy has, according to them, at the base of it, a black hole. Everything came out of a black hole. Black holes are literally portals to different universes. But we can't go in them. Now what's happening is the exact same thing. Right now, it's happening again. For some of us, this is the second time around. But for all of us, it's the second time around. We have a choice again, whether to evolve or to start all over again. The same thing is happening. Apparently on March 23rd of 1994, 19 suns in our galaxy pole shifted, totally flipped and changed their frequency. Other stars have done it since then. In fact, there's, they have said that our sun would actually be doing it as well between now and 2011. Would also be a pole shift and changing its frequency. Changing its frequency to what? Changing its frequency. Um, be becoming lighter, mm -hmm. more bright. Oh, okay. Now, apparently what happened on March 23rd is simultaneously, as this pole shift occurred, emanating from all the black holes in our universe, a color and sound frequency started emanating. It's the first time anything has ever been recorded coming out of a black hole. Now, the Hubble telescope took a picture of something coming out of the black hole, one black hole in Vega, the system of Vega, doing twice the speed of light, which they thought was impossible, that anything could go twice the speed of light. Well, here's something literally coming out of the black hole. They said it was gas. That's what they contributed to. Anyway, what happened is, it is, is apparently a 12th density, a new one. Now, according to the Andromedans, our present universe has 11 creational densities in it. These beings here have reached their plateau. This new 12th density is now connecting all the lower <coughs> densities all the way down to us and is literally pulling them up from the bootstraps. It is literally saying it's time to evolve and it's pulling everybody up. Those that want to evolve. 
So the whole process has started all over again. On our third density realm, and we live in a, a density realm where we have a 72 color spectrum. The color of aquamarine is the new color that's on our band. We're be, in other words, we're going to have a 73. For a short period of time, a 73 color spectrum. Before, the, before December 3rd, 2013, when we move into fifth density, those of us who survive physically, the earth changes, and the vibrational frequencies, by December 3rd, 2013, the entire planet and us are supposed to be in fifth density, where the color spectrum jumps from 73 to 210 color spectrum. It'll happen just like that. Black, uh, this uh, the black holies. I thought that was more of a vacuum, like that would crush if something went in. It would crush it. You're saying something came out. That's exactly right. It must have came out of them. But you say faster than. It well, you're, you're talking about God here. <laughs> you're talking about God. Now, according to the Andromedans, this 12th density does not have the dual polarities. It's only got one. Positive. So apparently the decision's been made that enough is enough. You're all going to evolve. Now, between us and the dog star Cirrus, there is a black hole beginning to be formed. In Perseus, there's another black hole being formed. And others, I only know about these two in particular. And negativity is moving in the general vicinities of those areas. Now there's an awful lot of negativity in our star system right now, in our sector. There's civil war going on in Perseus right now, all over that star system. And apparently what's happening is exactly what happened before. This is why the astronomers are looking at stars and they're older than the, what, based on our technology, which is infinitesimal. But they're looking at stars that are older than the known galaxy or the known universe. It's because all this stuff, including us, came from someplace else. We are literally ageless. We are literally eternal. We really are. You know, this is just, it's a suit. It's all it is. You're saying when you, the death comes in, you go to a different plane, a higher plane, you, or you go to another frequency. Yeah, frequency, okay. You go to another frequency. Now, a lot of people say fourth density. Let's let me try to clear up something for you here. So I hope I can. Fourth density, we are already in fourth density. You're already in it. Height, width, breadth. Time. That's fourth density. Fifth density is light, a higher frequency of light. What's happening is we are moving from third, we're already in fourth, we're moving into a higher frequency of fourth, and then into fifth. It's going to happen really fast for those of us who choose to, to evolve. Because it's just time. It's just time to do it. You know, there's no accident that we're here. There's a lot of metaphysical taught, uh, teachings that say we need to get to fourth density. We're already in fourth density. And even as, as we move closer and we become all telepathic, we all become clairvoyant, and we start evolving our spiritual skills which are ingrained in all of us, when those start to just appear, you are still going to be in a physical form. You're still going to need food. You're still going to need water. You're still going to need shelter. It isn't until we get to fifth density that our bodies become light. And then all you need is the sun. Or a sun. That's your nourishment. It's more light. Then you don't need to worry about water, food, you know, a Robinson CNR suit. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff then. Okay, because then we're light. Then we're back to where we are. To where we go when we're spirit when we leave the body at the time of death. Now, it's been recorded at the moment of death that 
between one to four ounces of physical body weight disappears from the body. That's the soul. That's the soul. Now, one of my contacts, I was living up in Lake Arrowhead, I got off the craft, I was crying, I was whining, I was being a real baby because I didn't want to come back here. And I, I'm off the ramp, and I'm walking in through the woods towards the car, and Viseas is standing at the doorway, and he telepathically says to me, Alex, turn around. So I turn around, look, I'm crying. You know, and it's hard being there and then coming back to see how we treat each other here. It's really hard. And he looked at me and he said, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. Lifetime after lifetime. And asking about it, asking him about it the next time. What happens is at the moment of death, we leave the body, we go to a, a dimensional realm, a higher frequency where we're met by other family members, our own higher self, or somebody who's there to assist us. And then we look at our whole life. We're not judged on what we do wrong. We judge ourselves based on where we withheld love during that lifetime. And we come back to fix that. To fix the withholding of love. Because the whole thing is about learning how to love. Ourselves and each other. So, as far as this being judged, <coughs> purgatory, and hell, it's crap, folks. It's total BS. That's not reality. That's propaganda. That's church propaganda. You know, we were talking today. Today's Easter Sunday. You notice how Easter changes? The same, the date changes. Sometimes it happens, you know, on different dates. Well, you know, didn't Jesus get crucified on one particular day? Why is it that they keep changing the date? You know? I asked a priest about that. He says, well, because it, it ties in with the spring equinox. I said, so what you're saying is that the holiday is celebrated for the benefit of man and not for God. And he didn't want to, he didn't answer it. He got really spooked and he says, well, you need to discuss that with the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I had him on the ropes. But he didn't bite. So, you know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, do you know how soon it's going to be that uh, we're, this is all going to take place or come down? I know it's happening right now, but is when we're going to evolve? Is it uh, five years? Is it ten years? Is it well, we're evolving all the time. So we're going to be into the fifth dimension. Or according to them, according to the Andromedans, December 3rd, oh, 2013 AD, we will be in fifth density. That's graduation day. That's when you get your cap and your gown and your diploma. And we're physically uh, going to be lighter? Is that it? Or you will, our physical bodies will turn into light. It's not too far off. Do you ever have an out-of-body experience? Or a dream state? A, clear, a color dream when you know you're in the dream? Yes. And you're, you have your physical body with you? That's what it's going to be like. You'll be able to go anywhere you want just by thought. Oh. Teleport. You will know everything about everybody else. You'll be able to walk up, shake this gentleman's hand, and the minute our hands touch, he will know everything about me, I will know everything about him. And he will know whether I'm a real person or not, or whether I'm full of baloney. How do we assure ourselves that we can... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? I was going to say, how, how do we assure ourselves that we can evolve? Is there certain guidelines we have to have? Or, I mean, it's a decision. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you love yourself? Do you love everything about yourself? I'm trying to. <laughs> Keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason we're all still here. <laughs> That's why we're all still here. Until we can honestly say with complete integrity, I truly love myself, then we're done. Then it's done. 
And I said, oh, that's, that's a hell of a lesson. That's, you know, that's a hell of a lesson. You know, because we have so many lifetimes of conditioning. So many lifetimes of conditioning. And it's just time to let it go. You know, and move into a space of, of who do you want to be? And then create it. I mean, there's nothing we can't make. There's nothing we can't create in our lives. You know? Nothing. You know, I mean, we can manifest terrible things happening to our lives. We can just as easily manifest wonderful things. But we think it's easier to create the negative things. Because the world tells us it's easier. You know, through the conditioning, the programming, the crime, all of that. I've heard that the reptilians feed off our fear. Is that true? Um, the Greys do and the Orions do. The reptilians tend to live off the flesh. <laughs> That's not an area I like to go into much. Um, but according to the Andromedans, the last 25 years, the reptilians that are on the planet are responsible for over 30,000 children disappearing. I get in a lot of trouble when I talk in UFO circles about this. You can't talk about that, Alice. Why not? In Westchester County, New York, in the last three years, 5,000 children yeah. have disappeared without a trace. In New York? Westchester County, New York. Yeah. Wow. George Andrews, uh, E.T. Friends and Foes, he's got a huge uh, section in his book on that. And nobody wants to talk about it. You know, denial is the dragon we all have. It isn't Lucifer, it isn't Satan, it's denial. Denial of our own divinity and responsibility. Yes, sir. Is it all the missing people or children who disappeared? Is it just uh, back Conans or are there other races taking children just for other purposes to take them back? Graves have done extensive, extensively taken children as well. Uh, a lot of them are on their motherships. A lot of the children were taken to Phobos which is also an artificial satellite. And um, they've been experimented on. Um, the planet as a whole, over 100,000 people a year vanish without a trace on the planet. They figure 25,000 in the United States on an average just disappear without a trace. What about adults? If adults, as if they are free spirits, they can't touch you as free spirit, or can they? <coughs> as a free spirit. Yeah, in other words, the uh, way I understand you're saying that uh, some of these people can't bother you, you know. They can't own your soul. soul. They can't, no. They, can't. The soul's eternal, you know, but your soul's in this physical form. form right. You know, that's easy to carve around. Well, who picks these, I mean, uh, the, uh, not dragon, but these, uh, do they have people like us who go away to these children? They sure can't come eight miles up. They can't get them on the earth. I don't know. Um, that's, they're having, they have help. They have help. They have help. They have help. Yes. Somebody on the surface is gathering the children and taking them to them. That's all I'm going to say. Because I'll get in big trouble. Especially now with the video. Uh, okay, but just just think out the process. Take it apart, take the whole thing apart, and figure out how could they get there. And you'll come up with the answer. It's, it's real plain. It's real plain. And who stands to benefit by giving them children? And they like children. Uh, let's change the number so that's the one I don't like to deal with. Yes. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to go a little bit into the polarities, the negative, positive. Uh, I'm just curious, why is the negative required to have the positive and vice versa? I noticed when you had the uh, the 12th uh, frequency or level, that it was simply the positive. Now, is there still a corresponding negative to that? Okay, that's a good point. Okay, we have 11 creational densities. There is always a duality. Now, up until you reach the sixth density, the positive and negative polarities commingle with each other. They interweave like this. When you get to seventh, the two share a space, but they do not commingle. 
Now, since I've not been to seventh density, all I can give you is what's been explained to me. The two can coexist simultaneously in the same space, but at the same time, they're not commingled. In other words, if I'm, a, if I'm a negative soul and you're a positive soul, you will see what I'm doing, but whatever I do will have absolutely no effect on you. None whatsoever, even though it's in the same space. Where here on Earth, you know, I can do something to affect your reality. Okay, which goes leads me into another thing. Folks, we're told in metaphysics, we're taught in metaphysics that you are responsible for everything in your life, that you absolutely positively create your own reality. Part of that is true, but there is such a thing as a violation of free will. There is. If there was no such thing, there'd be no karma. If there was no violation of free will, there would be karma. Is that something that's... It's a blind. Is it something that's imposed, though, or is it something that's... No, we're taught. It's a metaphysical blind. And the whole purpose is, is to get you to take responsibility for what somebody else does to you, which lets them off the hook. Now, this belief system was, of course, started by the ETs themselves, because they've been messing with us all this time. All this time. They're the ones responsible for creating religions. Literally. Literally. And it was to divide and separate us. At one time, we all spoke the same language on the planet. And the last time we all spoke the same language, the language was the Tamil language of India. That was the one language we all spoke. But we got too powerful. Remember the movie Stargate? You guys seen the movie Stargate? Yes. People came together and rebelled against the gods. There's so much truth in that movie, you have no idea. So much. Well, this is what happened. So they split us up. And all the languages that we have on the planet now are derivative of extraterrestrial languages. They taught us languages they already knew, as opposed to just creating up words. So all of our languages are extraterrestrial, virtually all of them. The original root languages are ET. They're alien languages. It's fascinating, the stuff that we have right underneath our nose. It really is. Okay, so the polarities. Um, this new 12th uh, density apparently just has one. And it's because it's at the highest point that it is electrically magnetic, e electrically changing and altering all the frequencies. It's also, my understanding is, Connecting them. Now, it used to be that as you went from one density to another, you would have to change your physical form. At the higher dimensions, you could not be a human being. Take a hum human physical form like we have now, or this type of shape. You have to have something completely different. Well, apparently, this is changing all this. This new 12th dimension, you can literally, at least preliminary, reports are this, that you can literally go from here and evolve all the way through the ranks, maintaining your physical human form if you so choose to. In other words, we have absolutely more freedom now than we've had before. And the whole goal is one of freedom. The higher you become evolved, the more freer you become. It's not supposed to be this way, where you can't scratch your neck or scratch the back of your head without somebody saying something. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Everything is against the law here. I used to work for Internal Revenue Service. I, I worked for them for 11 months. I was a tax collector. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was my lesson. But at the time, I went in broad-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I thought I was doing the government service. So this is when I believed in the government. And uh, it's an absolute fact. But the IRS has so many laws that no matter what you do, you're breaking at least one of them. <laughs> you're breaking at least one. And you can't help it. You can't help it. You know, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Okay, as far as physical changes in the United States or on the planet itself, um, 
basically learn to live without money, number one. Which means we're going to be going back to like the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, when communities came together and everybody worked together for the benefit of the whole. In other words, you know what your neighbors are doing and they know what you're doing. <coughs> you know, the doors are open, nobody has to lock them, you all band together. Uh, growing food, things like that. Uh, as far as the government, uh, whew, go out on a limb here. Actually, it's not a limb, I just don't like to talk about this. Expect some kind of civil war in the United States to last for at least eight months. It's going to happen. Now, Sue, what is your um, between now opinion? and year, between now and 1998? Expect the UN troops in major cities to go door to door trying to collect weapons. Expect it, and expect the militias to be the first to to become more and more more prevalent and um, expect the Vietnam veterans to be the very first to stand up and say, that's it, and take the stand first. Then it'll be the militias, then it'll be the local police forces. And then maybe some, some National Guard troops. Most of our active military troops are being sent out of the United States. But when you say stand and up and being replaced say, by UN troops. When you say stand up and say that's it, you mean that's it, no more, or that's it. Yeah, they take a stand. Right. They take a stand and say, you're not yeah. controlling us. This is way out of line. Yeah. Um, the Andromedans support a one world government, but they do not support the one world government based on greed, corruption, and professional politicians, which is what we have now. You know, their opinion is that if we were truly to form a one world government for the benefit of all people, it would be based on our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And in fact, they're trying to shred those. The UN Charter is, uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's a corporation. And we become le uh, um, resources, a natural resource of that corporation. And that's all you are, is a natural resource. You have, there is absolutely no recognition of the divinity that you are. None whatsoever. Right. You're a number. <laughs> what, you know, what state do you, what is the best state, what state to be in when all this happens? What actually, the best place to be would be out of the United States. <laughs> 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 um, but we are, well, we're going to stick that? it out. Why, why, do you, why do you say out of the United States? Because the United States is the most corrupt nation in the world. And this is not easy for me to say this. I love the United States. I, hang, I have a 13-star flag hanging up in my wall at home. If you're in the United States, you're going to be affected by the Civil War. You're going to be affected by martial law. Martial law in the United States is not going to be in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, or Peru, or Chile. It's going to be in the United States. Do you follow me? Sure, absolutely. Okay. So but we're going to be here. We're not going to bail. People have just had it. Sure. You know, we've had it. We, we've been rebels. Television has inoculated us to be warriors. You know, um, you know, and, and you know, on, a, on an intellectual, on a mental level, there are a lot of sheep on an intellectual level in the United States. But if they were to come in and build a fence and try to imprison people inside a city, Physically, blatantly, very few people would actually go for that here in the States. Very few. And the only way they can make this one world government work, the only way they can make this one world government work is to, is to do this. They can't keep us free. They can't allow us to be free. There's just no way. Plus, karmically, we're responsible for a lot of the stuff because we invited the Greys down here in the first place. But the Greys, their agenda is completely different. They want to enslave the world. They want to violate your free will. And that is a no -no. Now, if you give them your power, if you give it to them and say, okay, sure, fine, just make me safe. 
Just guarantee that I'll have a home and I can raise my kids and I'll give you all the power you want. Then you deserve what you get. And there will be some who do that. And they deserve neither freedom or anything else. If you give away your rights. And that's my opinion. That's my, I don't do a good sheeple. I never have. Yes, somebody else had a hand. Yes. Uh, about a year ago, the various Border Patrol units went under a training program where they were testing and practicing with their surveillance uh, technology from one one side to the other. They spent in a ten-day period. They spent two days uh, learning how to keep aliens from coming into the United States. They spent eight days keeping Americans from going into Mexico. Going so they were learning. Uh, there was a big flap in the Border Patrol at that time. A lot of people wanted to resign. They felt that there was something sinister going on for, for them to even be, be confronted with that type of scenario. Okay, let's talk about that. I'm going to loosen up my tie. It's really hot in here. Okay, let's talk about that. Now, let's look at the idea that the United States of America is the number one debtor country in the world. Now, the real portion of the United States, the legal portion of the United States, is only Washington, D.C., 68 square miles. Are you aware of that? That's the only true portion of the United States, 68 square miles. Now, since 1933, we started hearing the word democracy instead of republic. In school books, in magazines, this is done on purpose. There are huge differences between a democracy and a republic. In a republic, the chief rule of law is God, people, state, and then federal. Okay, this is a republic. To, to the republic for which it stands. Oops, that's supposed to be a P. Now, in a democracy, it's absolutely the opposite. It's federal, state, it's people, God bless you. And then go. The United States of America, if you were to take all the mortgages that you now have on your property, if you were to take every debt to a credit card, to a bank that you have, department store, if you were to take everything that the government did, all the defense contractors, all the money they borrowed, even the money that the banks borrowed from the Federal Reserve to keep the United States operating. Right now, today, the United States of America as a country, including all the 50 individual states, is $24 trillion in debt. $24 trillion. If you were to force sale the entire United States at a bankruptcy sale, Private and public land and property, you're talking about $7 trillion at a forced bankruptcy sale. This is why they want to keep people in the United States. Because we, as a natural resource, have been pledged to a group of men as bankers as a natural resource. They own our wages. They own our wages. It's pledged. Get a Black's Law Dictionary. Look this stuff up. I'm not making this up. This is reality. We have literally been sold out. Literally. Since 1933. And they can't let us escape because if we migrate out of here, they don't have a word for us. You know, and we have a very low tolerance for tyrannies here. Very low tolerance. And if they, can, if they can disarm everybody, and if they do suspend the Constitution, then you don't have to worry about Second Amendment infringements. There is no Second Amendment. That's how they're going to get around it. There's no way they're going to, they're going to uh, ratify the Second Amendment. What they're going to do is they're going to suspend the Constitution. Then you have no rights. They've set the whole thing up. 
to do it that way. If they can disarm everybody, then it's done. It's over. Now, I'm not an advocate of violence. I'm not. Absolutely not. But I'm not an advocate of slavery either. You know, I believe that if you go to work and you work 40, 50 hours, you deserve to take home what you owe, what you earned, and raise your family. I'm not opposed to giving the government a little peace to run the nation. But this is ridiculous. What they've done is absolutely ridiculous. Right. Absolutely ridiculous. You know, we're loaning 15, 16, 18 billion dollars to Russia. We don't have it. We're in debt ourselves. Two, two trillion dollars. We're loaning them 14 billion. And you know how they guaranteed the 14 billion to the Russians? They guaranteed pledged our wages. So if the Russians don't pay, and they're notorious for not paying, we end up paying it. Did they ask you if they could do it? Did you get a chance to vote on it? No, some imbecile in Washington cut a deal that you, your kids, and your grandchildren got to pay for. It isn't right. It just isn't right. Thomas Jefferson, it's almost, it's almost, it's almost taboo not to even to quote Thomas Jefferson now on a university campus because of some of the things that he said. One of the things that he said was a little revolution is a good thing, everyone. <laughs> he did say that. <clears throat> the tree of freedom needs to be water wise with a little blood once in a while. Once in a blue moon, or water. But actually, it doesn't need to be. You know, there doesn't need to be bloodshed. You know, we don't need to struggle with this. Basically, what needs to happen is that all the states just have to make a decision, and the people of the states have got to get on their state representatives they need to send people to Washington and just basically walk in and say, you guys are fired. Boom. And just let everybody go home. You're fired. Declare an emergency and re-elect an entirely new Congress and government. Get rid of the Federal Reserve. Get rid of the Internal Revenue Service. Get rid of the Department of Defense. All of those private corporations that call themselves the government of Washington, D.C. Just get rid of them. Fire it close the doors, board them up, take, take your National Guard, walk in there, and start all over. Just start all over. Our military is not going to shoot our people. That's why they're being sent out of the United States. Because they already know that they're not going to start shooting our own people. But the UN troops, they don't know us. They could give a damn. I have a little energy on this, I guess you can tell. The Federal Reserve Bank is not a, a lot of people think it's belongs to the federal government. It's not a part of the federal government. Yeah. It's a private concern. Right. Tell them the government what to do. Right. Yeah. So that's why Baron von Rothschild said it best. You allow me the power to, to uh, create the currency, and I don't care who makes the laws. <laughs>